So we're now recording our meeting and I would like to go ahead and do a short introduction for the midwife page. And uh, we're live, you can just unmute your mic for one second as I introduce you. Lorelai Morrow has been serving women since 1987 when she first began her training as a midwife. With years of experience in home and hospital care in developing nations providing care and training, um, she's worked with many people all over the world. She's also included develop, developing curriculum to train healthcare workers in the midst of the Ebola crisis, um, earthquakes, and has assisted in the refugee situation in Europe. Our second speaker is Taya Mola. She's a certified professional midwife, licensed midwife and clinical herbalist. She's been working as a women's healthcare provider and educator. She's been working internationally as a midwife for Midwife Children and been providing care for the refugee crisis in Europe and the Middle East. Her passion is helping women in low resource settings by bringing compassionate care and resources to the most vulnerable in need. Our third speaker is Cindy Nelly. Cindy Nelly is a certified midwife who was born and raised in Maine, USA. She's a very uh, experienced and diverse um, midwife. She served as a coordinator for international maternal and child care, child care projects in the Gambia, Kenya, Rwanda, the DRC, and in Colombia, South America. She's also taught for arts and medicine in Spain and Morocco and is a disaster relief first responder. And she provides relief, earthquake relief in Haiti and post Katrina in Mississippi and Louisiana in the USA. She's currently and most recently been working with Syrian refugees in Turkey and Lebanon. And our final speaker is Gina Sikwerk, who is, uh, she began her career in midwifery in 2015. Combining midwifery with her background in foreign politics and her years of experience in international work. And her career has led to work in global health and advocating for global reproductive rights. She's been providing midwifery and reproductive health care services in several countries and now focusing on the refugee crisis semi from Syria. So thank you so much, uh, Midwife Pilgrim, and I'm going to go ahead and mute my microphone. Um, for moving the slides, and I know you don't know how to do this because uh, you told me, Lorelai, if you um, look to the bottom of your slides, there's little arrows um, where you'll be able to move your slides backwards and forward. Should you have any problems, please let me know. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jane. So Midwife Pilgrim um, is a U.S.-based NGO, and we focus on global reproductive health needs. We are dedicated to responding to global communities in crisis and disaster situations, um, which in this case um, means a refugee crisis. Since 2015, when we um, began, we have sent um, 30 volunteers on 35 missions, impacting over 10,000 women and their families. Last year alone, um, we provided 35 we provided care to 3,500 refugee women and children in four countries. Um, in honor of today, three of our volunteer midwives will be sharing their experiences in Turkey, Lebanon, and Greece, um, though we have worked in other locations. We've worked in Sierra Leone, Nepal, Kenya, Haiti, and Jordan. And actually, we are looking into projects in Iraq and Serbia now, um, so uh, keep, keep posted. By the end of this presentation, we hope the participants will understand more clearly the living conditions and health care needs of refugee women and their families, the barriers to care for women in the humanitarian setting, the role of volunteer midwives in this particular crisis setting, and also ways that you can help um, on a way forward. So I'd like to turn it over to Taylor Moeller, um, a licensed midwife who worked with us um, in Greece and Turkey. Okay, hi, uh, my name is Taya Moeller. I'm a CPM and LM, and I live in Northern California. Um, I have a small home birth practice here, but uh, within the last like year and a half or so, I've mostly been focusing on helping to <coughs> bring care and aid 
to the women of the refugee crisis. And as Lorelai said, I've worked in Greece and Turkey. Um, my last two trips over, I've primarily been in Turkey and working with a project that um, is continuing. So I'll speak a little bit of that in my presentation. But um, first, I just want to talk a little bit about Turkey and the, what's happening there with the refugee crisis. There's um, about 3.2 million registered refugees living in Turkey, um, making it one of the largest host countries of refugees in the world. Um, this includes Syrians, Iraqis, Afghan, Iranian, um, some Somalian, and other nationalities. But out of close to, out of this 3.2 million refugees, almost close to 3 million of them are Syrian um, in the country, and some. Sorry, I lost my voice. Um, and there, are, and about uh, a little over 200,000 are hosted in camps. But other than that, the people are just displaced and living either in the southern area by the Syrian border around Istanbul or in western Turkey. And that's where I work, is in Izmir. Um, I don't know if, how big the map is for you, but um, it's over on the Aegean Sea. And we service about a two-hour radius there. And there's probably, at the height of the season in the summer, when I was there last summer, we were um, bringing aid and care to over 5,000 refugees. Um, the camp sizes, conditions, and number of people vary. Um, sometimes it'll be a camp of 20 to 30 people. Sometimes it'll be a camp of a few hundred people. Um, most are either in some sort of warehouse setting where they've set, they inside they build little kind of homes with tarps for themselves to for their families, um, or they do that out in the fields next to where they're working. Um, the unique part about the demographic that um, I've been working with in Turkey is that they are, most of them are farm workers and were farm workers in Syria, and so now since the war had started and they've had to flee their homes and leave their land, they've now become migrant farm workers. So they move around Turkey um, depending on where the food is being grown and what the needs are and things like that. Um, most of them are paid, but whether or not they get paid is the question. And if they are, it's, it's very little, the wages. And um, the landlords, they're also having to pay rent for these pieces of land that they're living on. And the landlord, um, sometimes they don't pay them. And like I said, if they do, it's very low wages. And they mostly hire women because they're cheaper to hire. And average is about seven American dollars a day that these women are making. So um, a few of the things I'm going to talk about today are the living conditions and health care needs of refugee women and their families. This includes prenatal and postpartum care well woman care and primary care, and contraception, um, clean water, basic hygiene, and access to resources, shelter, safety, and education. And then the two pictures on this slide, this is, um, this is one of the bigger camps that we worked with um, um, in a warehouse. And it's kind of both sides of the camp. So you'll see, like, they so that's the warehouse they're living in, and then inside would be their shelters. Um, as you see, there's a lot of standing water on the ground, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that later in the presentation. So um, the scope of practice for midwives um, is a little bit different when working overseas, especially for us that are licensed midwives in the States. Um, it also um, we do do well women care here in the States, but over there it also consists of doing primary care. So um, so midwives, um, sometimes I would be, you know, the only midwife, the only person there, and sometimes there would be a doctor or a nurse with me. So depending on that, you know, you're, you're holding the, um, the, the space for everybody, women, but also men and children included. Um, but one of my primary focuses being a midwife is, of course, bringing maternal health care. And that includes, of course, prenatal care. And so um, it's 
it would be like you would imagine, like a basic prenatal appointment. You know, I carry a Doppler, we do the vitals, we do um, urine analysis, you know, um, distribution of any kind of supplements or prenatals or maybe nutrition kind of help that they need. Uh, if we can, we try to get resource, you know, if they need like something for like their like a belly band or some kind of like clothes or something like that, we do help with that as well, but um, not quite as much. And we do, it within the last six months now, we have access to labs. So we're able to draw blood in the, in the camp and then there's a private lab in Izmir that will um, run the labs for us. So that's been a big um, thing that's been added to the care. And so most of the women there do give birth in the hospital and um, their C-section rate is high, but it's not as high as it is in Greece, which is good. And, um, but the care in the hospital is still not that great. And depending on where the refugee is registered, um, and they might even be turned away at the hospital. So um, we bring them to the hospital or they go, but then we usually visit them and also make sure they get home um, or back to their camps. And then that's where we continue on with the postpartum care. And as the same with prenatal care, it would be you know the same postpartum care that we offer here or that I would offer here. Um, but the follow-up care continues after a six-week period, um, which would leave my practice in the States. We follow through with babies of all ages. And um, so, yeah, um, one of the biggest <clears throat> things is the high um, need of resource for the people. Um, this can include anything from, um, you know, access to food, shelter, things like that. Um, one of the biggest things that I deal with as a midwife is um, resource to hygiene. and. Um, and education around that because it's not like the women aren't capable of taking care of themselves but there's just such little resource and any um, you know the toilets are really dirty most of them are just a hole in the ground where they're all shared sometimes by hundreds of people like I was talking about if the camp size is that and so there's been a really high um, I see a really high rate of um, vaginal infections in UTIs so um, you know, and most of it we treat allopathically, but we also try to get women like clean panties so they at least have a couple changes of panties, um, access to feminine project products, um, soap that isn't like chemical soap that's going to aggravate that because, um, yeah, um, so it's a lot of it is about education and just bringing resource. And one of the biggest things that we did in the, um, is what we've been doing in Turkey is bringing um, a clean water to the camps. And last summer we were given a donation and also paid for part of these water filter systems. And we were able to bring in this very simple water filter. They hook it up to the main source in the camp um, with these five gallon buckets and they were able to get filtered water, which was huge because we were seeing a really high rate of parasites. And especially in the children, it was bringing a lot of um, like diarrhea and vomiting and bloating and things like that. So we treated almost all the camps um, at that time, which was about 5,000 people, as I said, um, with parasite medicine. And so, um, and we saw great results with it. And that's continued um, as well, the Clean Water Project and treating people for parasites. Um, yeah. So um, the next thing I want to talk about is um, contraception needs and distribution and education around that. Personally, that's one of my, um, especially these last two trips, I've just seen such a need for that. And women are having babies, um, you know, they're having their babies they're getting pregnant at two months postpartum and having another baby. And they're young and um, their families are growing and it's, it's, it's not healthy, obviously, for the body, but also um, there's, they need the contraception care and, and a lot of them have reached out asking for it. 
And so um, we've started doing a distribution of oral contraception, IUD placement, as well as condoms. And so a lot of that entails like counseling and um, and just like talking to the women to finding what the right choice for them is. And I'm actually currently working on getting some grant money to start a distribution program that can connect um, <clears throat> just resources of this with other NGOs that are doing women's health care out in the field. Um, so realities of maternal outreach care and the barriers to this care. Um, one of those things is continuity of care, um, lack of access to women's health care due to the nature of migrant life and fear of the system, bridging the gap between health care systems and also meeting challenges due to police presence and coordination with other NGOs. So in these slides, this is um, the picture with all the people. That's kind of a typical like look of inside of a, a tent in one of the camps. And um, I'm, I took that picture, so I was sitting back. And we kind of just set up our with all of our medicines and our translator and all. And then everybody kind of comes in, and we see everybody one by one. Um, and one of the biggest challenges faced here is um, is treatment and in follow-up care because one people some people won't even take their medicines and then um, the other is having access to medicines because of the the movement with the people um, and so we about six months ago one of the ways that we decided was a good way, way to keep track of people is we thought oh we should start charting so we've developed the system where um, now we have charts and information on all the people we've been seeing and they're organized by camps and if there is a phone number or something like that we are able to do the follow-up care with them and so that's been huge in kind of jumping over this barrier and um, <clears throat> the other problem with this though is that a lot of people have fear of the system because there is such a challenge in bridging the health care gap um, and people fear either deportation back to the Providence in which they were originally registered, which is usually the south of Turkey when they crossed over the border, or just being deported altogether back to Syria. Um, this last trip when I was there, this was um, especially present um, because the police started showing up in the camps. And um, one of the times I was there and we were asked to leave, and that if we continued offering care, then you know we would risk the same thing, and that our NGO could be shut down, and as well as like international volunteers deported, things like that. And they also started to remove the refugees from the camps, and um, some of it was a little bit brutal, but most of it, you know, refugees were asked to go. The buses came, they loaded them up, and they were bringing them back down south. Um, so. Um, this picture right here with them loading up their stuff and that was one of the days we were out there and they were loading up everything to go. Um, so one of the ways though that we've been able to continue to bring care is to coordinate with other NGOs. And we as Midwife Pilgrim, you know, we, we place midwives in the situations of crisis and, um, and the, the main NGO that we've been working with in Turkey is called Medvent and it's a European NGO, but because of the risk of working as, a, as an international NGO in Turkey, we've partnered with some Turkish NGOs that have helped us to kind of bridge those, those gaps that I was talking about in the healthcare systems and help people um, get seen in hospital as well as to continue to bring care into the camps. Um, so I'm just going to tell this story about Ayat. This is Ayat, and she's the woman in the picture. And then the picture next to it is where she lives. And she, um, I met on my last trip. And her and her family, they are, they work in the lettuce field. So you'll kind of see where the clothes are hanging and the greenhouses with all the lettuce. There, these just like stretch on for miles and miles and miles. And um, to the left there, you can kind of see the porch, but it's just kind of a shanty kind of shack 
house, um, two rooms, and there was about 30 people living between the two rooms. Um, why I want to tell Ayat's story is it's not it's not too crazy of a story, but it's just a success story of why what we're doing and bringing care is is working and why it's so important. So when I met Ayat, she was about 37 weeks pregnant. Um, she was a first time mom and 19 years old, and she had had no previous prenatal care whatsoever. She just, I mean, being pregnant to her, she it wasn't even really a reality yet, you know, even though she was so close to giving birth. And um, so the first appointment we did, we found that she was very hypertensive, like um, 140 over 95 or something like that. And so that day, luckily, we were able to draw labs and run a liver profile and check kidney function and do a CBC and all those sort of things. And they came back mostly normal. Um, some things were a little bit on the high end, but um, so we started visiting her like every other day, checking her blood pressure. We ended up giving her a blood pressure cuff so that she could, um, uh, um, not a manual one, but a, like a electronic one or wrist one that she could use so to keep a log. Um, and we were able to continue to draw labs to monitor and as well as put her on a hypertensive medication for pregnancy. Uh, or that is safe in pregnancy, but over about like a week and a half to two weeks of this of just like back and forth, high blood pressures, all sort of things, um, it just wasn't going down. We were able to get her an ID where she was able to go to the hospital, and she actually was induced and ended up in a C-section, but um, both her and her baby are now well. And this is just, I use this as an example because like so many women that I've come across in my work um, in Greece, but also especially in Turkey, is that they have just been totally lost into the system and um, and they don't even, and there's just no education around even how to do that and there's no one there to help them. And so she was just a success story for that because had we not been there and not been able to help monitor her blood pressure and get her to a safe um, weeks of gestation to deliver her baby that um, maybe she wouldn't have you know, I'm not sure what the outcome would have been. So, yeah, thank you. Um, up next, the next speaker is a colleague of mine, Katie Neely, and she's going to be talking about her work in Lebanon. Um, and actually, Cindy Nelly is having some microphone issues, so this is Lorelai, and I will be um, doing my best to do her presentation. Um, Cindy Nelly's worked in a lot of different places um, and spent some time in Turkey um, just before or prior to Taya last year, and, um, and has recently been to uh, Lebanon. There are um, a one and a half million refugees in Lebanon, and if I'm correct, I believe they are, uh, considering the small population, they have um, the most ratio of um, refugees to the general population. Um, I believe it's one in four. She worked in the Becca Valley, which is north of Tripoli, and um, which um, is an area where a lot of refugees have settled. Um, I will do my best to um, go through her presentation. I've never been to Lebanon personally, um, but have spoken with Cindy a lot, and she's going to help me as we go along. Oops. Um, the living conditions and health care needs of refugee women in their families. Um, very similar to a lot of the other places that you have been hearing about. Um, Taya's discussion of Turkey, um, the presentation given before by Lillian um, about MPI in Greece, um, a lot of areas that have been set up for refugees, um, but not given the best of living conditions, so tents, um, and in fact, there actually are no official refugee camps in Lebanon at all. They are just areas where people are brought, which is what we found in Turkey as well. Um, so, because they don't want permanent. So a lot of people are 
go to a place, they set up their tent, they get everything set, and then they're given 24 hours, sometimes less notice, that they have to leave. Um, and then they have to find another place, um, sometimes an even smaller area, to then try to house these tens of thousands of people who are being moved from this piece of land. Um, some refugees have actually been there for more than 40 years, um, the refugees of Palestine, for instance. 70% um, of the refugees in Lebanon are not registered at all, um, which is, again, another typical thing we are finding in a lot of different countries that we work, um, which makes it very difficult for them to get jobs, to get care, to, to be considered official. So they're, they're outside of any system at all. Um, most hospitals are private, um, so therefore very expensive. Um, and healthcare is an issue. 47% of the pregnant women um, that Cindy was seeing in her area were receiving prenatal care, which was very, um, actually, I think, uh, uh, obviously not a great number. We should be getting 100%, but better than um, what I expected. And that goes to show uh, the dedication of these volunteers to get out there and to do the work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, Cindy is um, actually trying to send me some information as we go along. She, uh, there is not a signatory in the human rights um, for them, so therefore their protections are limited, these refugees. Uh, in this case, Cindy worked with the Syrian American Medical Society. Um, they had a program there. Um, they have actually several different programs at different times where they go in and provide health care, uh, primary care, maternal care, um, things like that. They did a whole week of GYN surgery um, using private hospitals, and they were able to provide contraception, uh, which is a huge issue of uh, refugees that we have found. I'm going to try to change the slide. Um, I don't personally know the story of um, this child. Uh, if Cindy could get on and tell me, um, that would be great. But um, you can see uh, an, uh, an example of the living conditions and some of the situations that these um, uh, children are facing and the people. Very, very ill um, sanitation, uh, so water is an issue, hygiene is an issue. Children are often alone in the camps um, because there's no clean water to drink. There's uh, no clean water for hygiene as well. You can imagine the amount of um, parasites that are around as well as situations like in this child. Um, Sadly, too, because of the number of children. Well, well, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, Cindy, Nelly, if you could possibly write in the chat box, because the buzzing uh, from either texting to ROI is disturbing the flow of the conversation. So, oh, sorry. Um, that's okay. That's okay. Um, it's just when we're trying to listen, we keep hearing your phone going off. So if, oh, um, if and Cindy I... wouldn't mind. If, yes, no, I... I comment. Great. And I'll just read it from there. Um, so, um, yeah, so Cindy, if you'll start writing in the chat box. You can even uh, do a personal one to me if that's easier. And I'm sorry about the buzzing sound. I don't know how to turn that off on my text, even though everything is, uh, the volume is turned way down. Um, one of the other issues of the risks to children and to women is there is a lot of sex trafficking, um, which sadly is typical in these types of situations. So there are a lot of health care risks, a lot of um, um, risks on a lot of levels. Um, here are some other photos that uh, she has been able to um, um, Oh, I, I, I'm going to go back one second, but um, she wrote me and said that there are 250,000 children that are not in school right now, um, which, as you can imagine, is going to lead to some um, major implications in the future. Barriers. 
Um, because it's a diverse cultural, religious, and ethnic population, you have refugees coming in from a lot of different countries. Um, that's going to mean not so much the care you give, that's going to remain the same, but how you give it can be um, tricky, as well as language issues. There's a huge country burden in Lebanon. One to four persons is a refugee. So um, that means three out of four people are um, native Lebanese, but one to four is a huge burden on the resources, um, uh, you know, jobs, um, uh, sources of um, health care, sources of, you know, water, things like that, food, will be very, very diff difficult. Um, movement within the country is restricted to refugees, um, which makes it very, very difficult. And um, they have a lot of curfews. Um, so arrests are made, um, therefore putting the refugees at further risk and uh, making it more dis difficult for them to um, receive care that they need. Distance to healthcare facilities and modes of travel. Transportation is a big issue. Um, a lot of people are afraid to travel because of their fear of deportation, which has happened. In fact, it's happened in um, a lot of the countries that we have worked in and something that we are um, uh, we are seeing as being a big barrier for people wanting to move or even to go to try to get health care. Um, they're afraid. They're, um, it, it's been mentioned in other uh, sessions that I've seen people are afraid to go to the hospital. They don't trust the health care people, and they don't trust that they're not going to get sent back to their country of origin. Um, there's a lot of abuse within those health care facilities, too. Um, there's a lot of tension within the local culture, so people who are trying to gain access um, to health care in a facility are not necessarily treated well. Um, and that's why mobile clinics tend to be better, we have found in a lot of places, with um, NGOs or independent volunteers going in and meeting the refugees where they are at. So we can see them. They don't have to worry about finding transportation. They don't have to worry about finding a place that will actually give them um, uh, compassionate and skilled care, and they're able to um, get the health care that they need. Um, in all of our uh, programs, Lebanon, Turkey, Greece, we've had great success with the mobile clinics. Um, Cindy was able to put IUDs in tents. Um, people are more willing to talk more when you're in their space. There's less of that um, feeling of, hierarchy, but you are coming to them, they are welcoming them into your home, and therefore um, them into their home, and, and therefore you are a guest. And and it changes the whole dynamic. They are a partner in their care then. Um, so it, it changes um, the the way that people view health care, and they uh, trust their providers more. Um, there's a lack of, of Pharmaceuticals, a lack of um, able to get the correct um, medications and things that are needed. But on the other side, there's often many, too many different NGOs trying to do the same thing. So there needs to be a, a way of coordinating. Um, we have found that everywhere we go. Um, you have all these different NGOs going in and doing their thing. And while they're doing great work, um, it just seems if people could coordinate, it, you could reach so many more people in a, um, and be more effective, actually, with that, um, with that type of system. Um, but that's a, that's a whole different topic on how <laughs> NGOs need to learn to work better together. Um, medication was brought into Turkey, um, as Taya had mentioned, and you're able to get it, um, but um, and brought into Lebanon, but it's less expensive to buy things locally, um, and it also actually helps local economies. So, um, in places where there is a lack of essential medicines, that that can be a problem, because sometimes bringing those medications in is too costly, um, or uh, you have problems at customs. Not in general, but um, we have had issues with that, and. Um, 
you know, so one thing we want to do is try to encourage local economy to buy by purchasing medicine there when available. Um, the role of the midwives. So as you can see, here they are in a makeshift tent, um, you know, doing their work. Um, this is, um, in this case, they're providing emergency response training and um, trying to train um, uh, other uh, healthcare workers and how to respond to, to um, uh, situations, um, uh, mainly because in Syria with the Civil War, there's been no training of a large amount of midwives. There's some programs here and there, but by and far, midwives are not able to be trained. So there is a push to train um, local people in, um, um, in these different areas who have any skill at all and are interested in how to provide the care for their own population, which is what we hope to do anyways. Um, it's always better if care is provided among your own community instead of depending on volunteers coming in from um, different places. Um, and as midwives, we connect people to services, so trying to connect them to social services or psychological services, whether it's contraception or primary care, um, uh, whatever is needed. You know, we often have that role of education, support, advocate, um, and, um, you know, just doing those sorts of roles means that you're seeing a lot of people and you're trying to coordinate with a lot of different areas. So in some cases, you may have a situation where you have a baby that you um, are doing an exam on and realize this baby has some serious health issues. So trying to coordinate with local facilities or to a higher level of care at a hospital, finding funds um, in places where it is a privately owned and you need to pay, ensuring that they get the care that they need, um, you know, coordinate make sure that when they're in that facility, they actually are getting the care, um, as mentioned prior, because refugees are often not given um, respectful care. They're often not taken seriously. So having somebody advocate for you, having a midwife come up and, um, and say, hey, this baby needs this um, ultrasound and this echo and possibly surgery, and then making sure that gets followed through can make a huge difference in the lives of um, these uh, women, children, and families. Um, oops, I didn't know, I missed this slide. So, um, uh, five minutes, because we do want, I think there's going to be some questions. Yeah, okay. So, um, we've talked about most of these. Um, so I'm going to just go on talking about all the different ways that midwives. Lorelai, I think Jane was letting you know. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yes. I think Jane was trying to tell you that it is now 20 minutes to the hour, and we, uh, if you need to have time for questions, you're going to have to wrap up in the next five minutes. Um, okay. Right. Then we're going to. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about this. I'm going to. Um, we're just going to go on then and go to uh, Gina in Greece who will be able to um, tell about her time in Greece. Hi. So with only five minutes, I'm going to have to really skim through this kind of quickly just to touch on the main points. And that's so hard to do. Um, so just really quick, my name is Gina, and I am currently in El Paso, Texas, working with an established midwifery practice, as well as continuing to work internationally in Greece, Lebanon, and Mexico. So I had traveled to Greece um, initially with the intention of volunteering in Lesbos, but by the time I arrived, the situation had um, shifted further north into the border of Greece and Macedonia. Um, and I ended up working primarily in a camp called Echo Station Camp. And Echo Camp held anywhere from 2,000 to almost 3,000 refugees at any given time, and depending on who was counting. Um, the unofficial camps, which was Idomini and Echo, they had a lot of limited resources, leaving countless individuals without basic access to food, adequate shelter, electricity, and, of course, health care services. Um, several international organizations and smaller NGOs and independent volunteers flocked to the region 
to assess the crisis and begin to provide some structure and basic services until the larger organizations could come in and establish care and services. Um, as we know, the need for re reproductive health is immense, and most care in the camp was and continues to be provided by volunteers and smaller NGOs. Some of the biggest uh, barriers to care that I encountered um, were just simply a lack of providers who were qualified to provide services. In Idomini, I was often one of two midwives available, and in that camp we had an unofficial tally of 600 pregnant women. In ECHO, I was often the only women's health care provider available, um, and we had anywhere from 30 to 60 pregnant women, and that doesn't include the postpartum women. Um, there is the issue of birthing in the camp versus birthing in the hospital. Birthing in the camp is considered unauthorized, as it was not done with an authorized provider, and unfortunately, birthing in the hospital was preferable for the sole purpose of establishing registration for the newborn. But even in the hospital setting, we found that this was often difficult to achieve. Um, and as we know, um, unregistered newborns and refugee children face an increased risk of exposure to violence, abuse, and exploitation. And in Greece alone, almost 77% of newborn refugees were unable to be registered or obtain um, an official birth certificate. There is a lot of miscommunication about the importance of birth registration, and a lot of refugees are frustrated and overwhelmed with the process of it. Um, and in addition to that, the process requires proof of marriage um, and other identity documents that were often destroyed in Syria or lost en route to Greece, and so that adds to the difficulty of being able to establish birth registration. The inability to establish birth registration makes it more difficult for the families to seek asylum further into Europe and to make um, forward movement in that capacity. The hospital setting is also um, has a lot of obstetric violence. There were women who were performed. One of the women that I transported to the hospital, she birthed en route. And when we arrived in the hospital, the placenta had not been born yet. But the doctor who was attending the delivery cut an episiotomy after the birth of the baby for no apparent reason. We saw many women that we transported um, receive C-sections without consent for no medical reason. The hospitals are overburdened. They don't have enough staff to handle the volume of the influx of refugees in those areas. Um, and then there's, because of that, they don't have the space for appropriate follow-up care. And we had women who received cesarean sections being returned to the camp less than 48 hours um, post-op. Um, we met women that had not been given any medication for pain management, and they were not properly educated on proper hygiene for incision sites, which we saw a significant amount of um, post-op infections as a result. Um, in Echo Camp, we established a mobile health care clinic designed to meet the needs of the women in the camp and provide a spectrum of care ranging from well women to prenatal and postpartum, as well as being able to provide resources for um, education and contraception. However, many of the women who would come from the camp to the clinic would do so for well woman care, and the pregnant women and postpartum women were more inclined to stay in their tent. So in order to reach out to the women in the camp, um, I set up a maternal outreach program, and in doing so, it turned into a daily routine. Um, I was able to keep the mobile clinic staffed with a rotation of GPs that were, came through the camp, and every day I would make rounds through ECHO and check in with the pregnant moms that I knew of, and in the process, I created a, a registry of all the pregnant and postpartum women in the camp and added to it, and it was it created almost like a follow-up blog where we could check in daily and make sure their needs were being met, check in on them and their babies, and as the bigger NGOs like MSF and other groups like NPI established in the camp, then we were able to use that registry to identify women who were good candidates for proper referrals for external resources. Um, in the camps, part of the mobile out maternal outreach program included spending the nights in the camps because 
with such a high level of PTSD, there were there was often a lot of um, episodes that would occur at night. There were people having severe PTSD attacks resulting in disassociation, violent outbursts. There was a lot of sexual abuse and assault that occurred at night. Um, and we quickly realized that we needed women healthcare providers as well as emergency healthcare providers maintaining a presence in the camp 24-7. And so that's part of what I did with the maternal outreach program. Um, and it, the, the outreach program also just provided another great form of support for the women who were enduring those difficult situations. Contraception in refugee camps is always a difficult topic to navigate. Um, there's an absolute need for contraception and education. Um, we received tons of donated condoms, but found that there was a reluctance from the men to actually use them. And the women in the camp were desperately trying to avoid pregnancy. And on this photo, or on this slide, you can see a photo of a broken spoon. And the head of the spoon was being used as a makeshift um, diaphragm type device. And I also removed pieces of kitchen sponges that had been cut up and even saran wrap type plastic from women who were attempting to use these as makeshift um, barrier contraceptive devices in lieu of condoms and other methods. Um, the pill and IUD and injection are other methods, but it's difficult to maintain consistency with them. Um, it's difficult to maintain follow-up. Um, we distributed birth control pills and we had many situations where the men were very upset about that. They took them from their wives and brought them back to us at the mobile clinic and felt as if we were interfering with their families and their family planning. They were very, very upset about this. Um, and so the women would come back to us and ask for the pills. I'm sorry? You have to conclude now. You'll have to conclude because you have questions and we need to clear the room for the next speaker. So if you can conclude, and there's a couple of questions, but if you could just take one question from the audience, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, so um, just to quickly wrap up, I'm going to flip to the next slide. Um, establishing a sense of community became an imperative way for us to bridge healthcare gaps and provide support and networking services um, for the women and their families in the camp. So, um, yeah, so now we'll open it up to questions. I will take one question, and I think the question is really relevant here. Um, somebody asked, how did you all get registered um, to work there? Or how did that work? So um, I think that's the question we can take, and then we'll have to finish it. I'll, I'll answer that. So um, it's, it's an interesting situation with refugees. Um, most providers are not registered. For example, in Greece, only physicians are registered. We um, have not been able to find a legal way to register midwives, and it hasn't been required. When most of the um, situation was on Lesbos, we were working toward that, but then they switched. Um, everybody uh, was moved to the mainland, or most people. And what we have found is that registration occurs depending on where, what location, which camp. It is almost impossible to do. So no. We are not registered as midwives in that um, situation. Um, the midwives that work in with MGOs um, that are registered in Greece um, go under their um, requirements and their uh, rules and regulations and whatever they have set up with the government in that location. Um, the independent midwives are working independently. And a lot of the NGOs, in fact, I would say the majority of the NGOs doing the majority of the work are actually not registered. While you will find there are a lot of registered NGOs, um, our assessments have shown that the, the NGOs reaching the most people, in Greece at least, are not registered. In Turkey, it's even more tricky. Um, they're not even allowing NGOs to register right now. Um, in fact, you may have heard in the news recently the arrest of a lot of um, International Medical Corps volunteers who were legal and registered. Um, a lot of NGOs are being kicked out. So no, nobody is registered there, which is, um, so it is a, um, it is an issue and something that we talk about with our midwives, that you are uh, potentially exposing yourselves. You are working in an area 
where you are not licensed. Um, we ask midwives to not practice out of their scope of practice. And yet, we also know that that's also not a reality sometimes. When you have somebody coming to you with a serious health condition and the hospital is absolutely refusing you care, um, you know, ethically, we do not feel we can um, turn these people away. So that those are the issues. Um, I'm not sure about Lebanon, um, but I have a feeling it is the same because it is what we are finding everywhere. We are registering as an NGO in Iraq. Um, and are very excited about that. And then we will have to see how that works with our midwives. Midwives that work with Midwife Pilgrim or that we send to other NGOs are licensed in their country of origin um, and have gone through um, specific trainings that we require. And we're actually going to increase those trainings. We do not send um, people that are not ready or um, have the ability or without the licensure. We feel that. That is very important. Um, I hope does that answer your question? I believe it was Joy Kemp um, who asked that question earlier, but I, I hope that. Um, okay, that, um, that's great. You can finish off um, midwife pilgrim. Thank you so much uh, for such a wonderful um, presentation. It's uh, a very moving and important. Um, provision that you're providing there and we really appreciate you and I'm going to go ahead and 